Hi class, so this week we are going to be talking about the brain and the central nervous system. So really we're taking a little kind of biological, psychological view of that mind-body connection. And so when we are looking at the brain and the central nervous system, we know that they are kind of the major influences on our behavior. As far as our body goes, all our basic body functions, you know, are controlled by the central nervous system in the brain. Of course, the brain is the biggest part of our central nervous system, and we even kind of call it the command center of our body. So when we're looking at the central nervous system, we know that there are complex network of cells throughout the body and each of those cells are uh, called neurons and uh, when it comes to neurons we basically we have millions upon millions of them not just all over our brain but all over our body these neurons are how we get information so it's how our brain gets information to tell our body to do different types of stuff so so you know as humans as just uh, being alive we're constantly in inundated by all sorts of uh, outside stimuli, right? We can use our uh, five basic senses. So, you know, our, our smell, touch, hearing, and uh, taste, those are all made up of neurons. So, you know, that, that information comes in, those neurons get that, and then they pass it along throughout all parts of our body until it gets to our brain. And then once that signal gets to our brain, that's kind of when we figure it out. So kind of like, think about when you touch, touch something hot. So when you touch something hot, and there, there is a there's there's a reaction that's going on, and sometimes you know it is kind of delayed reaction. It may take you a couple seconds before you're like, "Ooh, that's hot," and you pull your finger back, and that's because of that connection, those neurons running through up, uh, running through up to your brain, and you know it just kind of takes a couple minutes depending on what part of your body it, you, uh, you, you're getting that sensor information from on how quickly it gets to your brain. So think about that. So kind of the further away you have a body part from your brain kind of the longer your reaction is going to be so think about when you're driving a car sometimes you know if you have to stop immediately and you go to hit the brake you know it kind of takes a couple minutes there for that reaction to actually carry through because you know we have to wait for that information to get up to your brain for it to get processed and then it has to go back you know it has to be processed and said oh you know there's a car coming at me I need to uh, step on my brake and then once your brain figures that out all the neurons then carry that that, that uh, information back down to your foot so then that your foot knows to uh, press the brake there and so a lot of that really happens in, in a way we could say unconsciously because we don't really you know run around thinking about how we're walking the ground we're walking on you know how we talk how we move our hands we're not thinking about you know moving our mouth as we speak those are kind of you know but that's all information that neurons are carrying into our brains and telling our bodies to do but it's like it's not there consciously you know we're so inundated with stimulus and then just you know being human and, and all the responsibilities we have of living in society that um you know a lot we, we would be totally overwhelmed if we had to you know worry about thinking about that information too you know think about that on top of everything else you have to worry about you have to worry about telling your brain to move telling your heart to beat telling you know telling yourself to to take a breath and so you know our brain does that kind of you know deep beyond uh, below our consciousness to kind of help free up those parts of our, our brains and our bodies to kind of think about other information so kind of interesting to think about there so when we're looking at the central nervous system when we're looking at our neurons we do have a few uh, basic parts of those and, and once again you know all these basic parts inside our bodies inside these cells all work together just to uh, you know to help 
um, uh, circulate and, uh, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, provide us with that information. And, uh, you know, it's just the way that we stay alive and healthy. And uh, this is why it's kind of a little biological, too, because, you know, we're really get breaking it down this week and looking at these inner workings uh, on a cellular level. But uh, I just want to point out there, too, is that, you know, you guys remember, and looking at this mind-body development, we're not just focused on humans. We're looking at animals too and you know there we use animals in a lot of different ways and then when it comes to uh, psychology you know a lot of the ways that uh, we use animals just has to do with help telling us about you know helping us figure out a little more about what it means to be human but the reason I bring that up is because kind of all these different parts that we're looking at you know animals have these two on a very um, more simplistic level plants you know kind of have these basic functions you know what sets us though a little bit apart from the rest of those species is when it really gets to our brain and how our brain is functioned, you know, functioned structured excuse me and uh, you know with us we have those higher brain functioning so all right so and thinking about that and thinking about all these different parts of our central nervous systems and our neurons there we have uh, something called a gli uh, glial cells and uh, basically, these are, uh, think of them, they're like this kind of like little uh, encasing around each of our neurons. They're like this little protective layer there. We also have uh, myelin too. But uh, these gyla cells are like these little insulated protective layers that help feed those neuron cells. So, you know, food we put into our body, the different chemicals that go into our body, you know, this is these are kind of the ones that process and, and kind of help feed it to those neurons. Think about um, when someone being pregnant, you know, how when a woman is pregnant, that baby inside of her is being fed through that... Uh, I forget what it's called now, but being fed through uh, the, the placenta and, and, and the tubes that run through there. So that's kind of the same thing we're talking about. Each of those little cells are kind of like incubated in this and these little uh, glut it's so hard to say, glial cells there. And then, you know, once again, they're important because they're what keep us alive and keep us healthy. All right, so to go along with that, we also have myelin in the myelination process. And uh, basically with that is that uh, when we were, you know, prenatal and then as we grow and to develop, into different stages of our life, we constantly have this my, uh, myelination process going on. And uh, pretty much what this is, so those gyal ce shell, uh, cells are kind of like the little insulators, kind of like the little uh, you know womb encasings, you can kind of say. Whereas this myelin is kind of like the goo that kind of goes around it. It's kind of a plastic coating, but that, that that's a good way to think of it too. It's kind of like this substance that's all all on the outside of it and uh, we have to remember and that when it comes to our cells and when it comes to neurons specifically we're working on that bioelectrical impulses so you know it's all this chemical reaction but it's kind of this energy thing so there you know there's heat there's electricity there's kind of fire uh, you know all, all those chemical processings we, we work on and so what this myelin does, why I say it's kind of like this, you know, this goo is because uh, it, it's that uh, barrier that keeps our cells from burning out and overheating. So, you know, so it's kind of that protective layer that keeps it, that keeps everything in and keeps it insulated and make sure that, you know, not too much information not only gets into those neurons, but into those gyal cells, right? And so, uh, basically, with these uh, myelin there, uh, if we get a bunch of them and we wrap them all together, then we start to get our nerves. And that's a big part of our uh, neurons, too, because our nerves are kind of our sensory. Think about it on your hand. You know, when you touch those different parts of your hand and you feel it, that's kind of nerves. You know, when you feel a twitch maybe a muscle spasm or something, you know, that's all your nerves working there. And it all has to do with this idea of sensory information and how that's coming in. And then uh, some of it has to do with just maybe our bodies trying to tell us stuff too. We'll talk about that here in a few minutes. So basically when it comes to these not, uh, myelin 
axons, nerves, as we call them. We see what you would, uh, a good way to think about how they look in our body are like a bunch of different cables wrapped together. Think about when you go into the office or like you say you go to a school building and you go into the computer lab and everybody has all the computers set up and there are all those millions of cords that are all laying around connecting everything to electricity, right? And a lot of the times the we, we wrap those cables up so they're like these big bundles that are kind of there behind our computer, right? That's a good way to think about our nerves and, and kind of how they are, uh, look inside of us and interplay together. And we need everything to be connected together like uh, like that inside of us because once again that's how we get information to our brain and able to you know that makes us able to survive and we know from mental disorders and just even things like brain traumas or other types of injuries to the body that when there's something wrong with that neural connection and, and you know those that information isn't getting to the brain the brain's not able to uh, get its instructions back to parts of the body then we see uh, you know we start to see kind of dysfunction and behavior and kind of thoughts too right Alrighty, so now that we've kind of got that little information there about uh, the parts of our neurons and our nerves, uh, you know, that are that are uh, encasing our neurons there, let's go and look in and kind of break down our neurons just a little bit. So like I said, these chemical reactions, this information that is being shared between our brains and other parts of our body, it happens in kind of an electrical, it's that energy, you know, heat, electrical signals that are going on. And so, when we have a neuron pick up on a single signal, excuse me, and then uh, it's ready to pass that signal on, we call that the action potential of the neuron. And so, think about what I just said about uh, trauma. So, if we have some kind of trauma and that sig signal is not being sent, then we, that neuron has no action potential, right? And basically when it comes to neurons, we have this idea that it's kind of an all or nothing. So basically what that means is that neuron is either, it's either going to have that action potential and it's going to work or it's not going to work. So a good way to think of it is, uh, once again, think about all these different chemicals inside our bodies. Not only do we put chemicals in that kind of get processed from our foods, and, and I don't mean that as in saying that all they're all bad chemicals, because they're not. You know, that's just part of how our body breaks down stuff. It breaks it down in these chemical reactions, all right? And so, in thinking about that, think about like a, um, oh, like the Panama Canal, like like boat canals like that. Basically, a lot, uh, the way that those types of... Um, that the, that the way that those are set up is a lot of times they kind of have like these lifts and they have these gates and you know depending on the water level the boats kind of go up and they got to go through this another gate and it's kind of this succession of, of different kind of entryways and stuff that you have to go through, right? And uh, so we can kind of think about that uh, as going on inside our bodies too. So basically we have these neurons and of course, you know, we have all these other cells and then we have all these chemicals that are kind of, they're outside them, they're going in, they're coming out and uh, some, and, and so you can think of it as like little canals, little channels that are either opened or closed. And so, you know, when they're open, ions get in, ions get out, chemicals get in, chemicals get out, and then, you know, they can get to a point where they're so full, they have so many chemicals and ions in them that they get to what we call a resting potential. So it's like they kind of close back off again and nothing can get in and nothing can get out, but this isn't a really a bad thing because we still have a charge there. They're still able to send information, you know, they're able to do that electric uh, pulse that they do there all right and uh, it's really those ions which once again chemicals are what we're talking about that come in that allow us to have a positive charge to those neurons and now this can get a little complicated because once we start looking at like mental disorders and uh, looking at certain chemicals, um, we, we don't really see that it's not that the neurons aren't charging, it's just what happens there is that they misfire. So let's think about um, just real quickly off the top of my head, like depression. Depression usually involves like a lack of dopamine or serotonin in our body, especially in our brain. 
and uh, dopamine that's like the number one drug number one chemical in our body that we naturally produce and it's our natural feel good chemical so uh, sometimes we can have too much of that sometimes we don't have enough like with uh, states of depression it means we don't have enough so what that means is those channels are closed and it's not letting that proper amount of dopamine in or it's closed and it's not letting that proper amount of dopamine of uh, serotonin in or it can be the other way it's not letting it out and so you know you've we've got so much of that uh so we'll, we'll go with serotonin because that's more of the depressant you've got so much of that build up in in uh, those cells that it can't release so therefore you know you kind of get in these uh kind of heightened states there because you know your your body is reacting on the influx and the amount of that chemical in it and so then what happens we start kind of seeing uh, abnormal behaviors you know which would be uh, uh, behaviors that go along with depression so uh, just kind of something to think about there and uh, then back to uh, when I was giving the example about kind of the amount of time it takes for those signals to get to our brain and then back to the different parts of our body so basically we say that's one one thousand uh, one thousandths of a second uh, two miles and the slowest shortage so uh, sometimes it could be up to 275 miles per hour so you know this stuff's happen really really quickly inside our body there right all right so when we look at these neurons we do break them up we have different parts we have axons dendrogals and uh, so basically um, we get those those electrical signals they come down they reach that first part there the axon and we call that the axon terminal all right <clears throat> a good way to think about uh, this little process here and the axon terminal I think about trains and the train cars and uh, you guys should know even if you've seen this somewhere on TV played with trains as a kid you know how train cars they all have that little piece in between that has to connect one to the next right and what happens it comes the train comes in it goes up to it and they kind of like you know they connect you think of little toy train sets there's a little magnet in there so when you put the cart on it grabs it and it's connected right that's what's going on here with our neurons and the way that they are uh, capturing that information so it comes in and that little hook then goes and grabs that other little hook think of it like links so it comes in and it links to the next one and then you know once again it links all the way throughout whatever part of our body it needs uh, you know it is to get to our brain there <clears throat> And then what that does is that gets these neurotransmitters and then what we call our synaptic vesicles to uh, start releasing those synapses and kind of uh, create that signal there. So things like dopamine, serotonin, those chemicals I'm talking about, we call those neurotransmitters. So uh, there are different types of those that go through our body. And like I said, they, they also have an effect on our kind of moods and mental states there all right so you got the axon and then the next part is the little synapses and then you have the little dendricles that are kind of like you think of tree roots that's actually what dendrite means is tree root because it's talking about all those different little fingers that come off of the bottom of a plant when you pull it up on the root system right so that's kind of what these axons look like too so we can't think of them in a linear sense they're kind of more like a uh, a spider web type network of, of, of those uh, braided kind of <clears throat> neural chains there is a good way to say that um, one fun thing about neurons is that uh, we have these really cool neurons I'm trying to let me think for a minute I, I, I think this is kind of unique to humans because animals don't really do this but uh so we have these things called mirror neurons which means that uh we have neurons and we have this connection that will be made in this action or um behavior that we will do and it's something that mimics other people so what's a good example of a mirror neuron you guys yawning right how did think about it when you it's really hard to not keep yourself you know to not make yourself yawn when you see somebody else yawn because it's a mirror neuron it's kind of this reaction we see 
and then our body thinks that we have to do it too. Um, another one, smiling, frowning, even though, you know, that's kind of sucky. Who wants to have someone frown at you? But, but you know, think about it. When someone smiles at us, we have the tendency to kind of smile back. If someone frowns at us, we kind of have a tendency to make that little scowl on our face too. And once again, it's not something we're not thinking, oh, I'm smiling, oh, I'm scowling. You know, we may think after we perform the act, but you know, that initial act is based off these near uh, mirror neurons. And I always found that kind of cool there. All right, so that brings us now to uh, kind of looking at our central nervous system. And when we're talking about the central nervous system, we are specifically talking about our spinal cord and then our brain. So all these different little neuron, uh, neural networks that we have all over our body, you know, all that information that's getting sent, it gets sent to our spinal cord and then it gets sent up to the brain. So, you know, it's all got to connect there, right? And so when it comes to looking at our spinal cords and our central nervous system, we have some different parts there. All right, and like I said, so we have neurons that send the information in, and then we have neurons that send the information out. So those first neurons that are coming in, we call them afferent, so A, F, 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 afferent like effective and uh, that you know those are the ones that bring the information in so these are those sensory neurons right and then from there once it gets in and, and you know it needs to turn around and spit those instructions back out then we have the efferent neurons so like effect with an e there and uh, we would say those are more kind of the more uh, the motor type neurons because that's what tells our senses what to do basically that's what tells our muscles and the different parts of our body what we need to do <clears throat> And then we also have uh, what we call interneurons. So these are kind of those uh, connector ones there between those afferent and those efferent neurons. And so that helps to, to coordinate the systems there. So that so the signal that's coming in that you're stepping on that you have your finger on something hot and you need to take your finger off doesn't get crossed with the signal that says hey you need to breathe right now or or you know the signal of, of how to move your feet doesn't get cross with the signal of how to move your hands you know that's where those interneurons go they're kind of the little guys that stand they're like traffic cops right they stand in the middle and they direct everybody where to go that that's a good way to think about those <laughs> All right, and then uh, the two uh, basic parts of our central nervous system are the per, uh, peripheral nervous system, and then we have our autotomic nervous systems. And so with the uh, peripheral nervous system, just by that word alone, it indicates that it's kind of a, a little bit separate here. So these are all the neurons and all, all the nerves in our body that are not in our brain, our spider cord. So these are the ones that are in the rest of our body there, okay? And we break those down into somatic nervous system and then the autonomic nerve. Uh, uh, <clears throat> autotomic nervous system. All right, so then uh, we further break down the autotomic nervous system into the sympathetic division and the parasympathetic division. And now just remember here with this uh, autonomic nervous system, that's the one that I'm talking about that, you know, these are those neurons that work and they work kind of in that background of our just uh, kind of daily lives and daily functionings there. So, you know, our body and our brains and all these neurons and nerves, they're doing all this stuff for us like I said so you know we have more time to um, basically just get out and live and enjoy life and not have to just be worrying about you know taking care of our body I, we probably wouldn't survive if we had to worry about you know the, the, the things that our bodies do on a daily and nightly basis you know if we were totally in control of that none of us were survive so it's a good thing that our brain and our central nervous systems have these systems in play to you know just once again help us survive there <clears throat> All right, so with the autonomic, uh, autonomic, excuse me, sorry guys, I always have trouble saying that. With the autonomic nervous system, these are basically, these are those basic unconscious actions 
actions. You know, these are uh, part of our fight or flight response. These actually are part of the most basic uh, basic parts of the brains too. We say some of this is just, you know, basic instincts. <clears throat> and so, uh, uh, with the autonomic nervous system, you know, it's unconscious to us. It's at a very basic, it's that most pa basic, primitive, instinctual level of survival. The most primitive, basic kind of parts of our brain there. But we need it to maintain that homeostasis. And so, what is homeostasis? Once again, that's that stability. That's that survival that I'm talking about that we don't have to worry about what's going on, you know, as far as our basic body and motor and nervous system and, and just operations go, you know, and that that is homeostasis. That's, you know, our bodies and our brains, you know, naturally keep us alive and keep everything regulated. And then, of course, like we said, of course, you know, that's not like 100% always the case because we do have abnormal uh, abnormalities that can be present, right? So the sympathetic uh, system, that's the one that keeps us active and functioning. And then the parasym uh, parasympathetic is the complement to that. So basically, this is the one that controls, um, you know, those functions like salvation, you know, tears, defecation, sexual arousal, urination, digestion, you know. Think of all the those basic systems we have of the body, ectorine system, you know, digestive system, uh, sex systems, you know. Think of all of that, and that's what we're talking about here with the parasympathetic system, uh, with the parasympathetic nervous system it's controlling all of that stuff and we kind of say it's a uh opposite to the flight or fight a uh, flight or fight response there and it's not so much that it's opposite is that you know like one's positive and one's negative it's more like it's opposite because it's controlling uh, it's controlling and over others overseeing different parts of our bodies and and you know allowing different functioning and so basically we just need both of those and so uh, they both work in balance to keep everything going and functioning in our body. All right. So, like I said, these structures of our brain and our central nervous system, and they're not unique to humans, animals, even plants. I have many of these uh, basic biological parts and uh, you know once again it just changes from species to species as far as the like the complexity of these systems and of course you know we are as far as we know we are the most complex of all these systems especially when it comes to our brain so uh, basically all animals have brains, so, you know, we can, uh, all animals have brains, and they're all divided into this basically rough three portions, the forebrain, the midbrain, and the hindbrain, and then once again, as we start increasing in, um, cognitive capacities <laughs> I don't know if I want to say that but as we start increasing and uh, ah stimuli and the amount of activity going on in the brain that's when we see things start to get more complex so when it comes to our brains our brains are very complex and we uh, do know these basic fun uh, these basic structures and basic functions but it really comes down to it we have barely scratched the surface on, uh, you know, how all these neurons and these neuron transmitters and hormones and, and these different parts of our brain, we don't really know how all of them work together. And uh, so, you know, that's one of the reasons in psychology why we do a lot of experiments and research it, uh, research. And uh, it's really cool, guys. The European Union is actually uh, working on a project. It's called, it's a mapping the brain project. And so uh, basically what they're going to do is they are going to map every neural connection in our brain this is something that has never been done before and uh, i just 
I can't imagine it's it's not going to be a quick process. It's going to take them years, maybe decades, before this is finished. Because you got to think about it. What what did we say about these neurons? We have millions and millions of them all over our body, and uh, you know we we know we have millions and millions of them in our brain. And once we actually they start getting in there and they start mapping each one of those, I think they're going to find out that there are probably billions upon billions of it, and uh, it's really going to help explain uh, just some things that are going on, uh, not only as far as what is consciousness, you know, what, what really is going on with these chemical reactions in our brain, but the main focus with it is to help with things like seizures, to help with things like Alzheimer. They already are making chips that they can put into our hippocampus. That, well, I don't think they've actually... I don't know if they're out of the testing phase yet, but they are working on memory chips that they can stick into our hippocampus. And so uh, basically it's uh, when Alzheimer's, you, you already have this chip, and then when Alzheimer's uh, starts to kick in and, and people start, and that person starts losing their memory, they'll put that little chip back in there and it will help, you know, create that connection to get those memories back. So uh, cool stuff going on there, definitely. And it'll definitely be interesting to see what the results are of that experiment. And then, of course, the ethical implications and kind of intent and motivation of all of it, too. So, all right. Hopefully, at the time that I shared that story with you guys, you have gotten a chance to read each of these uh, different parts of the brain here. So, um, what I have are uh, 15 of the most basic parts of the brain listed. Of course, you know, if we were to start, once again, our brain brain is complicated and when we really start getting down into it you know these are the main structures but then there are like different parts that are still down into that and some of you guys may be nursing students and uh, if you're a nursing students you've taken your anatomy classes you've probably learned all about all those different nerves and uh, different parts of the brain so you guys you guys are well aware of just how really complicated we can get with all of this but what I do for this video or for this lecture I give you these basic 15 parts and then um, I'm not going to play it during the lecture because it just you know takes up time and, and uh, makes it a little harder to download to get these uploaded on the internet because it eats up space but what I've done is I've listed these and then I have a great little video that I'm gonna have posted along with uh, this this discussion video and uh, the guy in the video he goes down and he breaks up each of these parts of the brain and explains uh, their basic functions it's probably I think it's about 12 13 minute video it's not long at all you guys and I would um, I would highly recommend that you do watch watch it to get a good overview of what's going on with these different parts of the brain. And then, of course, throughout class, as uh, we talk about this stuff, we'll definitely cover that, too. So, all right. So, uh, as I was saying, you know, along with those basic 15 parts of the brain, we also have these other areas. Some of them we call association areas. So, basically, these are little spots in uh, different parts of our lobes or the, or the different um yeah, different lobes of our brain that just help us kind of, you know, make sense of all that information that's coming into us. Because once again, guys, I, I, you know, our brain protects us a lot from just the overwhelming amount of sensory information that we do have coming at us every day. And then, like I said, compound that with the amount of uh, sensory information that just society and technology throws at, at us on a daily basis. You know, our brains need all these different parts and all these different neurons just for, you know, just for that purpose, just to help us make sense of it so that we are able to function and then of course survive right um so uh just a couple of those kind of common association areas there that we have and uh these are important because they both play a role in language and being human means that uh you know we do verbally communicate with each other so we have the broca area and then we have the warnakes area and i think the, um, they're both responsible for language, but kind of different parts of language. So with the Broca, that's kind of more of a... Uh 
the hearing, the being able to reiterate what you hear, whereas the worn X kind of comes in more as like those more subtle nuances of language. So things like um, a pronunciation and, and just tone and, and you know, kind of the, like I said, those more finite things that have to do with our language. And if you just think about that for a minute, you know, it kind of makes sense. Once again, you know, we have these big brains that have a lot of stuff going on in them. Oh, that's a good point. Uh, we do use more than 10% of our brains. Actually, you guys know that. We talked about that last week in that first discussion. So think about that. There's so much uh, going on inside our heads that it would uh, seem kind of, uh, it makes sense that our brains would kind of organize it into this different areas, you know, to keep from things getting all jumbled up. And then once again, you know, that's what we know with things like a brain trauma or things like mental disorders, mental illnesses, you know, that's kind of one of the reasons that we know something's wrong. There's something wrong with those signals because, you know, we see, uh, we, we see those signals getting crossed just by the way people are acting and behaving, right? <clears throat> Alright, and so when it comes to our brain, of course you guys know it's, it's broken up into uh, four main lobes. We have our, let me go back and show you guys that. So uh, there at the bottom there we have our frontal lobe, we have our uh, occipital lobe, parental and temporal, I can't remember which side of the brain the temporary and parental are on there. But uh, basically our frontal, this that's the executive part of our brain. That is our executive, that's where our executive functions come in. So that's like the command center and uh, basically it's in charge of everything else that goes on in our brain. Occipital, of course that has to do with uh, uh, seeing and hearing and then parental, uh, it's, it's just like with the parental nervous system there, it's kind of those other things that go on and then temporal and that has to do with things like uh, audio, hearing, seeing, stuff like that, right? So, uh, so, so, and then once again, so within each of those lobes, we have these different little areas that are working together, you know, to, to get those signals um, communicating and functioning properly and then of course when we look at our brain we know that it is made up of two sides we call those two hemispheres those are uh, our cerebellums and then uh, cerebrum is basically what, what we call both of those uh, parts of our brain kind of looking at the overall overall area of it that's kind of the cerebrum there because that's one that's kind of connecting those parts and then we have different little kind of nervous systems and functionings that uh, connect the different parts of our brain too and uh, just from things like brain trauma and uh, you know being able to do things like split brain researches uh, excuse me research that has helped us understand that you know the sides of our brain that they're not identical to each other that's how we know that uh, you know different parts uh, different sides of our brain kind of control different things within us especially uh, when it comes things to more uh, we'll, we'll say like Gardner's multiple intelligence there so you know that, that that's just kind of real quickly the idea that um, intelligence is not one single thing we can be smart in one thing and, and not in another but that's okay because we want to focus on that gift so say like you know somebody can be really musically inclined that would be like musical intelligence but say like bad in math somebody be really creative really bad in math that's me and then we know that uh, from the logical side to kind of like creative side that that different different sides of our brain relate to those types of functioning so lots of interesting stuff when it comes to our brain all right so then uh, make sure you what like I said you watch that little video there and it breaks down those different parts of the brain and then like I said as we go through class We'll definitely uh, come back and talk about different parts of the brain. That's actually one of my most favorite things to talk about. So when it comes to our brain and our central nervous system and all these neurons that we have going on, uh, we say that those, you know, those are the main communication systems in our body. But aside from neurotransmitters, we also have hormones. And, and once again, when it comes to abnormal behavior, when it comes to mental disorders, 
hormones and neurotransmitters. Uh, when we're looking at those from the biological perspective, those are, are the two main things that we always come down to. So neurotransmitters, dopamine, serotonin, hormones, uh, estrogen, that's, that's, that's going on hormone I can think of right now, <laughs> testosterone, you know, all those, all those things work together in our body and, and like I said, you know, with mental disorders, trauma, maybe they're not working out. And once again, you know, that, that, that is how we understand more about the mind-body connection and kind of what it means to be human and how we should be human and then relate that, you know, those goals of psychology to explain, predict, understand, and control behavior. We know that from, you know, taking this biological look uh, and seeing these different hormones and these different chemical, electrobiological type uh, communications going on in our bodies. And then, you know, when, when, and then so then when we see those abnormal behaviors, it helps gives us those signs, those clues as to, uh, you know, finding more of a solution because that's really the biggest thing with like abnormal psychology and uh, things like ther uh, th therapy and treatment. It's all about, you know, getting help and, and helping people be positive and productive members of society. And so when we know about what's going on at these biological levels, that then helps us, you know, pinpoint in more to help get that person the treatment that they need. So all right, so real quickly, we're gonna look at kind of our hormone system and our body, and we call that, you guys can tell I'm not a nurse, right? And so we call that our endocrine system, our, uh, you know, our endocrine gland and they're the ones that actually secrete that hormone. We have a couple different types of those that are, you know, really important to just our survival and just, you know, kind of our thoughts and actions and, mu and moods there. Of course, we know the pituitary gland that is uh, responsible for um, those hormones like uh, milk production, just making sure that uh, we have the correct salt levels in our body and uh, kind of helps guide the activity of other glands there. Then, of course, we have the P penal gland and uh, the penal gland wish I had my brain but the penal gland is kind of like right it's like this little tiny tiny like bean shaped thing that's kind of like right here if you guys know anything about like Buddhism Hinduism they talk about uh, the third eye your third eye chakra and how it's right here in the middle of your forehead that's kind of where your penal gland is located so just thinking about that on that line alone you know and the penal gland has a lot to do with just uh, kind of how we go about perceiving reality and, and uh, you know, how uh, our body is able to function and the different states of, of, of kind of consciousness and reality that we go through. And uh, so we know that it's really helpful definitely during the sleep cycle because it helps with that melatonin secretion. And, of course, that melatonin is what helps us sleep there. And then, of course, we have our thyroid and our thyroid is important because that's what regulates our metabolism and of course you know you know that's important because that metabolism that's how all these different chemicals are getting processed in our body and so we know from things like obesity things like diabetes that you know if your metabolism your thyroid glands not working properly that's going to cause some type of a physical somatic type issues there. And then, uh, oh, since I mentioned diabetes, this is the next one along, the pancreas. We know the pancreas is very important. It controls the blood sugar in our body. And then <coughs> we have the adrenal gland. And of course, that is critical because that's what helps uh, regulate our body's response to stress. So that goes back to that, you know, that basic primitive fight or flight response uh, or instinct that we have in our in amygdala way uh, in the back of our brain there kind of close to our brain cells it's part of that uh, hind brain that that primitive part of our brain and then you know adrenaline is just important in general 
there, you know, like I said, especially when it comes to stress. And then last but not least, we have the gonads. And of course, those are our sex glands. And uh, those are what regulate our sexual behavior, reproduction, and then just all those different uh, bodily functions that comes along with things like uh, puberty, menopause, for men, we could say things like uh, erectile dysfunction or just, you know, overproduction of uh, testosterone. All of that is being controlled by our gonads. And then, you know, it's all connect it's all connecting back to these neurons that are, you know, going in to our central nervous system and our brain and telling our bodies what to do. So with the gonads, we have ovaries for females. And then in males, we call those testes. All right, guys, so there is the YouTube video I am talking about. I didn't link it there, so I will make sure that I have that linked for you guys. You will be able to find that in the announcements right along with this video. Alrighty, so now that uh, we have covered our central nervous system and our brain, we've looked at our secondary uh, communication system in our body there with our endocrine system, I want to talk a little bit about somatic psychology. And then I have, um, a, this is kind of a wrapping up the discussion here. And then what I have is I have uh, a short little video with uh, a Dr. Peterson that talks about, I think, I'm pretty sure she's a got a PhD. Now I can't remember. I might have her confused with the other lady. But anyway, I have a video on a, that talks a little bit more about what is somatic psychology. It kind of brings in, uh, you know, we're really uh, bringing in the mind-body connection and then ideas of things like mindfulness, which, uh, you know, plays a big role in how we um, kind of regulate that mind-body connection and, and how our thoughts pay a role, uh, play a role in that. When we're more mindful of, of our thoughts and our kind of our emotions and our moods or temperaments, you know, just kind of the states of where where we are at in life it's really e you know easy to get stuck in those negative states and uh, when we're a little more mindful of those different things going on inside of us it really helps us to be uh, you know to change those into something more positive and productive that's more serving to us and our survival and then in turn you know that help by by you know find by tra transforming and those negative things into more positive and productive things that just you know it not only helps us but it helps in our engagement with others and you know kind of helps make a uh, society a little better place and I don't say that like Susie Sunshine and you know life is not all unicorn and rainbows but there have but there are uh, researches that uh, research that suggest that things like mindfulness practices things like somatic practices that they generally are good for our minds mind and body and uh, just our health in general there so just a little background on that because uh, I do have a little somatic exercise that I give you guys and I'm not sure I have a mindfulness practice too that I'm not sure if I've already given you guys it's kind of a mindfulness practice to help uh, that that's supposed to help create space so that when we go to study we put our minds and bodies in the state of, of being alert to studying. When we do something like mindfulness practices or somatic exercises, what we're doing is those neurons in our brains are lighting up. We're sending that connection to our brain that says, hey, now is the time to stop thinking and stressing about everything else that, that you can't do anything about right now and pay attention to what's going on right here and right now. And, uh, you know, the Buddhists, they call it a a monkey mind. We all have those voices and that chatter that goes on in our brain constant, constantly egging us on and, and you know and a lot of times it's it's a lot of negativity that we have going on in there so it's causing us a lot of unnecessary stress and when we can learn to say Shh, stop I, I don't have to worry about you right now I'll think about you at another time right now I need to focus on doing this you know it does just you know once again it helps us with relieving those level of stress that we feel in our life and it helps us be um a little more ex uh, successful in uh, areas of our life because we are increasing our cognitive capacities you know we're helping you know put ourselves in better moods and it, it's 
well, I am not a licensed therapist, but you know, uh, it's definitely a good way if you don't want to go into medication side of things. It's a good way to help you know create that balance inside yourself without having to add you know more chemicals into your body. So all right, well, so when we look at somatic psychology, we're basically looking at the body. Soma is actually the Greek word meaning body, and so. Um, this is where a little bit of uh, abnormal psychology and mental disorders come in too because uh, somatic used to mean it was all in your head. If you heard someone say, oh, they got a somatized disorder, it's psychosomatic, right? Maybe you guys have heard that saying before. We used to mean, and, and uh, basically what it is is that somebody would come into a doctor's office and they'll complain about something that's happening, but you really can't find a cause for it so um oh what's a good example it just your fingers hurt you go in oh doc i've got a problem with my hand my fingers hurt they run all the tests on you for like all the possible and known and unknown diseases that could be causing your fingers to hurt and they find absolutely nothing wrong with your hands but you still insist that something is going on and so that's you know like then when in the past be like oh you're just crazy it's all in your head give them a lobotomy lock them up and you know we don't do that anymore we kind of take we take that more holistic approach and be like okay so we can't physically find something that is wrong and causing this pain then it's something else that's going on and yes it is kind of something that relates more to some mental processes uh, processes in your head and a lot of the time it has to do with the way your body is responding to stress I'll give you guys a good example. So uh, there was this like a uh, mining company in Australia, all right? And unbeknown to all the people who were uh, working at that company, the company was going to, you know, some of these people have been there 20, 30 years. You know, they'd worked at this place their whole life. We'll come to find out, rumors start uh, being thrown around that the company was going bankrupt and uh, they were going to close their doors and uh, pretty much everybody was going to be without a job. Any benefits they were going to get, nobody was going to get them. And so, uh, so, so uh, all of a sudden, people start complaining about like their arms are hurting, their hands hurt. You know, like everybody started having these kind of somatic complaints. And, and you know, they'd go to the doctor and they couldn't figure out what was wrong until someone made that correlation of oh wait a minute it's the stress from thinking that you know you're going to lose your job and not knowing what to do about it it's manifesting manifesting itself in these physical ways and so when it comes to abnormal psychology we do have types of somatic disorders there's like conversion disorders and then we also have, uh, it's a mouthful, but it's somatization type disorders. And, uh, you know, like I said, sometimes uh, these disorders come up. And, and uh, most of the time it has to do with just uh, the way the body is responding to stress and uh, so you know that kind of makes it a little bit easier for uh, treatment and therapy but then we have cases of these types of disorders um, to where they're a little bit harder to crack say like uh, somebody who is a hypochondriac so we know hypochondriasis hypochondriasis is uh, when uh, somebody they, they just they believe they, they read about a disease they read about an illness and then they believe that they have that and it's just you know somebody sneezes and and then they sneeze and they're like oh my god I'm gonna die I got the flu you know like that that's of course an extreme case of it but um, but uh, when it comes to those uh, with hypochondria you know it can be really hard because once again you don't find anything physically wrong a lot of times even if uh, they do you know brain scans and brain images they're not finding anything you know no, no disconnect in any of those neural pathways and so it makes it a little bit harder to uh, get that person treatment and uh, you know because you have to really figure out what's going on there you know why is this person you know making up these these maladies to get this attention you know what's really going on there so so when it comes to somatic psychology and like i said these different types of somatic disorders they're uh, very interesting and, and you know we have these good ways that somatic psychology can help us and then on the other spectrum we have these very 
and kind of a uh, strange things that go along with it and uh, like I said makes it difficult to get treatment there and you know that's kind of the main goal of psychology is to figure out you know what's going on in people's minds and, and and how that relates to how people are acting and really um I'll probably stress this a lot I think I already have it just comes down to stress a lot of times you know most disorders are not biological they they're just the way we respond to stress so all right so uh, basically hopefully you guys have had time to read all of this stuff so I do have a good little definition about what somatic it is there from the free dictionary.com and uh, like I said you know when it comes to these somatic exercises or uh, mindfulness types practices it's just about you know getting that balance between the mind and the body so that we're all happy healthy individuals working along our paths of self-actualization and, and you know trying to reach those higher versions of ourself like humanist psychologist Abram Maslow would talk about and uh, he's when he came up with the whole hierarchy of needs and, and uh, just this whole idea of self-actualization and how it's about just us trying to be the best versions of ourselves as possible and so these types of exercises help with that and that is all I have for you guys. I, I do have a, a nice little somatic exercise. It's actually, it's also, a, we call them a muscle relaxation exercises too. Because when it comes to stress, a lot of times we do hold that in our body. And for me, I, I see it tend to, my shoulder always hurts. I always tend to hold a lot of stress in the back of my body. And so when I try these different types of uh, exercises, you know, it does help bring you a little bit of relief. So if you think uh, what I'm talking about with all the somatic stuff and mindfulness sounds a little hooey, sounds a little on the pseudoscience side of psychology, just uh, hopefully that is, uh, you know, sways you back to the uh, scientific side there. We do know that exercise exercise exercising the body exercising the mind it really does just generally help us as as individuals our moods it helps with you know the way our bodies are able to uh, get that stress off and just general around they really are kind of good things to do to help us all be uh, you know reach those optimal levels of happiness health and well-being so what i will do since i didn't put it in my powerpoint here is i will make sure to have uh i have a, like i said that video that talks a little bit more about somatic psychology and kind of these uh, somatic deep relaxation type exercises and then i have just a little short one it's under 10 minutes that if you would like to try i would certainly encourage that and that's all i have for this week this guys i'm working on getting your stuff graded and uh, I will have all of that wrapped up by Wednesday at the latest. And uh, make sure you get in there and get your discussions in this week, you guys. I really had a good time getting to meet everybody last week. Uh, you know, delving into, uh, or actually not delving, but starting our journey of uh, psychology. I know we're going to have a great class. And I just want you guys to know that I am here for anything that you would need. Please don't be, uh, please do not hesitate to reach out to me for anything. And uh, I will see you guys next week in our next lecture. And then I will EC you guys in our discussion. So, alright guys, thanks. Bye. Oh, there it is. Oh, well, not ground yet. Alright guys, there are those videos I were talking about, but I'll make sure that I put those, some, uh, I uh, link those too for you. So, alright, thanks. Bye.